I set the recording, so it's 11 o'clock Eastern time and welcome everybody. Um, let's have some fun talking about planting wildflower meadows for pollinator habitat. And um, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we're really happy to have Kathy Neal here from the University of New Hampshire. And I've had a lot of fun preparing for this with her. I've learned a lot already and you guys are in for a treat. Um, there is a good number of people, there's over a hundred people on this webinar. Everybody should be muted, so hopefully we won't have all that background noise that normally comes. Um, I am recording this, and uh, within a week there'll be a copy of the recording uh, that comes, uh, that, that you'll be able to watch and freely share with uh, people who might be interested in this. And uh, there is a very cool feature uh, that Zoom has, um, and I want to point it out to you because it's how we're going to be taking questions this morning. If you roll your mouse over the Zoom window, which uh, shows the IPM toolbox uh, slide there, at the bottom you should see, about in the middle of the screen, you should see something that says Q&A. And if you click on that, you can ask a question. And we're going to be uh, taking five pauses during this webinar to ask uh, Kathy some questions. So if you want, don't use the chat feature, uh, use that feature there uh, to put in your questions, the Q&A, and uh, we'll be taking a break and our wonderful uh, Nancy Cusimano is going to be um, uh, go looking through those questions and picking the best ones to, to ask. Or probably if there's, sometimes there are questions that five people ask the same question, so she'll come up with that one. And um, so, um, so hopefully that's all the housekeeping that we need to do. We'll give you a link to the copy of the recording at the end. And these slides uh, also are going to be available on the website. So you don't need to be writing things down or worrying if we go too fast through you know, a link. Uh, you'll be able to uh, look at the copy of the slides and just cut and paste it for yourself. All right, so wonderful. So let me introduce uh, Kathy. Um, so Kathy works in the landscape and nursery industry to develop and conduct educational programs that enhance the environment and provide ecosystem services. Pollinator habitat, biodiversity and water quality protection are areas of current emphasis in outreach programs and in teaching sustainable landscape design and management. And um, she works at the um, University of New Hampshire, and um, she's a founding member of the Northern New England Pollinator Habitat Working Group, which is something that we funded here at the IPM Center. And her expertise is in selection, planting, and establishment practices for landscapes using native grasses and wildflowers for creating sustainable pollinator habitats. So there you have it, and thank you, Kathy, for taking the time to put this wonderful presentation together. And, um, and for being with us here this morning. Um, so um, first we'd like to start with a couple of questions. Just, uh, we have a lot of people on the call and we'd like to see who you are. <laughs> so um, I am going to launch a poll and hopefully on your screen, you should see two questions. One is what is your background? And the second is where are you located? And you should be able to click and vote and so your options for your background are home gardener, master gardener, researcher, university extension, farmer, landowner or land manager, that's if you have a land trust, something like that, or other. And where are you located? Uh, northeast, south, are you brave souls who may have been going through Florence? The Midwest and the West, yeah, it's a little early for the West, so I'm not sure we're going to get any people from the West today. Um, all right, so I'll just leave that running for uh, a few more moments just so people can uh, define um, themselves and it helps Kathy because then she knows uh, the audience that she's uh, talking with and, uh, and where you're located, which uh, uh, obviously this is a program of the Northeastern IPM Center, but uh, we welcome everybody to, to view these. All right, so we're still getting a few more coming in. So I'll just wait one more moment. All right, so we're at 105, and uh, it's still chopping up a little bit. Okay, I'll just wait a moment more. All right, I think everybody's had a chance. All right, so um, 
The largest uh, option is um, master gardeners. 60% uh, of people are master gardeners and 26% are home gardeners and 14 are university extension people. So um, that is our, those are our biggest categories. So we've got a whole bunch of gardeners. And uh, despite my accent and the fact that I should genetically be uh, programmed to uh, be a natural gardener, uh, I actually don't really fit very well into that category. Uh, but I, do, I actually do have a little wild flower, uh, pollinator um, uh, bed at my house. And most of the people are from the north, uh, northeast. We have 94% of the people from the northeast, uh, a few from the south, three from the south, and three from, four from the midwest. So there we go. And oh, I can share the results. There you go. So you can see the results for yourself. All right, wonderful. Okay, welcome. So um, um, I'm going to put the poll down. Hopefully that clears it. And then Kathy. Um, so what is a wildflower meadow and how is planting one an IPM tool? All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Just testing. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Good. All right. I'm going to advance the slide here. All right, so this is a picture of a wildflower meadow and, and to me and what I'll be talking about today, we're looking at wildflowers as dense and diverse naturalistic plantings of perennial wildflowers and native warm season grasses. So this might be different than the mental image that comes to many people's mind when you say meadow, which is kind of a mowed field or pasture type of a situation, which is heavily grasses with a few uh, non-native, primarily weeds slash wildflowers in them. When we're trying to create pollinator habitat, we want to have, have the density so that we can pack a lot of pollinators in there and provide lots of forage material for them. And in the context of IPM, we're creating resilient additions really to our agro ecosystems to serve as pollinator habitat so that we have reservoirs of, of pollinators to provide pollination services. Well, we're not using IPM in the traditional sense of, excuse me, controlling or managing a pest. We are um, adding stability to our agro agricultural systems or gardens. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we're thinking in the broad sense of integrated crop management, perhaps more than in integrated pest management per se. Okay, well, I was gonna say, don't worry about the frog in the throat. I've had this when I've done webinars too. So <laughs> <laughs> I will let you take a drink and I'll ask a question while you can take a drink. And if you need to take a break for that to mention. So, um, so if I have a piece of land and I'd like to make a pollinator habitat, what's the first thing that I need to be thinking about? So um, if it's something I'd love to do, but I know nothing about it, what, what are the things I need to start thinking about? Okay. Well, of course, there's lots of things to think about, so it's hard to say what's first, but today we'll be covering all these things about <clears throat> what, why, where, when, and, and spend a lot of time on the how-tos, the practical advice that I can provide to people to um, make them successful in establishing pollinator habitat. <coughs> Great. Um, so when uh, planting for pollinators, um, are you primarily thinking about bees and, um, and or are there other pollinators you need to think about and, and, and what do bees and other pollinators need? So for most people, the first thing that comes to mind when you say a pollinator is a honeybee, right? Yeah. And, and we've all heard about the, the decline in honeybees and the threats to honeybee health. And that's made us aware of this uh, problem and the fact that we really need pollinators for uh, the majority of our fruit and vegetable and, and uh, horticultural crops. And so while we've depended on honeybees for, for many, many years, and they're easy to manage because we can move hives and relocate them according to what crops are in bloom and so forth, we'd really like now to think beyond honeybees and to uh, maybe reduce our reliance on honeybees, which by the way, are not native to North America. They were imported by some of our early colonists. 
Um, but we do have over 4,000 species of native bees in North America. And it's been documented here in Northern New England that we have at least 250 species uh, residing in, in, in our ecosystems here. Many of these are effective pollinators and that they may, may fly and forage and pollinate in cooler, damper conditions than honeybees. Um, most of them are generalists. In other words, we'll forage on a lot of different things. So would go to crop plants to pollinate them, but also can be supported by planting a great diversity of um, flowers for them to, to feed on when crops aren't in bloom. They may or may not like the same plants as honeybees. Um, so we'll talk more about that later about which bees like which plants best. And just one more important point I want to make is that we're not talking here about yellow jackets and paper wasps and aggressive wasp species, which actually need uh, animal protein to complete their life cycle. Most of the bees here that are pollinators are vegans. They're, they're out there uh, completing their life cycle on pollen and nectar and do not have any reason to be aggressive unless they're under threat, like when you grab them sitting on a flower. So when we think about creating pollinator habitat, of course, we have to ask ourselves, well, what do bees need that we need to create uh, places for them? <clears throat> what have we taken out of a lot of our gardens and agricultural systems that maybe we can restore? And the answers are fairly simple. They need food. <clears throat> they need pollen as a protein source. And much of that pollen is gathered by uh, worker bees and taken back to provision their nests to raise the next larval generation on. And they need nectar. And nectar is the sugar source for quick energy. So that gives them the energy to fly and um, metabolize while they're out there foraging as well. And they need a place to nest. Uh, primarily to lay their eggs and raise the next generation. And of course, we want all this to be in a safe spot that's protected from pesticides and other uh, exposure to things that may be harmful uh, to them. Thinking just for a minute, um, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about floral resources, but they, they do need places to locally to make their nests and raise their young because a lot of these native bees are very, very tiny and they just don't have the energy to fly for miles like honeybees might. They'll generally forage and make their nests within uh, several hundred feet of, of where they uh, emerge from in the spring. Um, about 70% of the native bee species are ground nesters. In other words, they're going to make tunnel nests just by digging holes in little bare patches of ground or abandoned nests that were created by rodents or birds or some other creatures. <clears throat> and then the other 20 to 30 percent are cavity nesters, which means that they uh, require some kind of a hole to nest in and lay their eggs in. And any uh, plant that has a pithy or a hollow stem, especially something like sumac or raspberries or even milkweed can serve as uh, a good nest for these types of, of bees. And some bees prefer actually woody material. And so leaving uh, dead wood snags around for them to nest in, perhaps along the wood's edge and so forth is a, very uh, good practice if you want to encourage those. And this is also where we can create bee houses or bee hotels uh, to kind of mimic these types of natural systems. Fantastic. So I've already learned two things. I did not know that honeybees were not native to the United States and, um, and that they were vegan. <laughs> I've never thought of a bee as being vegan. <laughs> Um, so I live in a village, so I have a, a very small plot of land and I don't really have space for a meadow. Um, but what kind of techniques, um, I, I'd love to hear the difference about, you know, a garden bed that can be planted for pollinators versus planting a meadow if you have a larger amount of space, and which we'll be focusing on today. Yes, um, so we're going to use a lot of the same plants. We're going to arrange them differently if you want to create a garden rather than a meadow. So while a meadow 
<clears throat> provides the most buzz for the book in terms of packing in those floral resources and having places for nesting sites and creating a, a defined safe habitat for bees, we can um, create men, or meet many of these needs also in a garden situation. But consider that there are also other ecological benefits. If you have room to, to even create a small meadow patch, then you're also creating wildlife value and habitat for birds and other types of animals. You're uh, protecting soil and water quality. You're basically creating a, a low input or no input a uh, system where we recycle the nutrients, we provide infiltration areas for stormwater, and so we're conserving energy, we're not mowing, uh, weed eating, and so forth very often. And often overlooked is the connection to nature, which of course can occur in a garden as well, but sociologists uh, tell us all the time how important the, the opportunity for humans to connect with nature is. But if you don't have the space, then you don't have the space. Um, and some people just frankly don't like this look that's a little bit um, unkempt or wild and woolly. Um, and that's fine. We can, we can create a garden that's good and to support pollinators as well with a little more thought. And maybe you have some favorite plants or want to use some different species that wouldn't do well in a mixed meadow and then we can certainly plant a garden instead. So when we're talking about a garden instead of a meadow, then we're, we're adding a little bit of a design element to it. And we're saying, well, these are the plants I want to put in my garden and I'm gonna give each one their individual space so that they can not worry about competing in this great mixed mass of things. And so we can make some plants and species survive and thrive in a garden that perhaps wouldn't survive long-term in the meadow. So that could be one advantage to a garden. We can design for uh, seasonal bloom and for diversity and make it very uh, pleasing in terms of aesthetics. For the bees, it's best if we plant in, in groups, um, you know, a few square feet or a meter square of a, a plant that has a mass of flowers on it that will be more attractive to bees that are out foraging than just one flower here and one flower there. Of course, we still want to avoid pesticides uh, as much as possible in a garden situation or, or be very, very aware of which ones may be harmful to bees and avoid those. We still need to tolerate some bare space and not like mulch everything, you know, three to four inches deep with uh, bark mulch or something. That doesn't allow bees that bare soil in order to create their local nesting in it. So go light on the mulch and maybe leave some spaces. And also we can let the, the seed heads or uh, plant materials stand later in the uh, fall. I mean, right now is a lot of time people are looking at doing fall cleanups and they want to cut everything down and neaten and tidy everything up. But if you can take it a little bit easier, you'll provide more habitat for more species over a longer period of time. Okay, great. And I'm just going to ask uh, Nancy Casimano, who is our um, who is our question and answer queen, if uh, there are any questions that have come in. Yes, okay. there's one question. And I will read it. I have found more and more people and places are planting pollinator gardens, citizen zoos, parks, etc. Are we seeing any positive results? Or is all the pollinator news still negative? <laughs> good. That's a good question. It's been hard to document uh, because there hasn't been good baseline data in terms of uh, native bee populations. Uh, the USDA does keep uh, track of honeybee colonies and honeybee losses and so forth, but most of those aren't going to be tied in with these natural types of pollinated gardens that you're mentioning there. So right now our observation is that when these gardens get planted, we see a local increase in the numbers of bees and other pollinators using those resources. We can't say for sure that those uh, bees are, you know, on a, on a upward trend in terms of long-term populations, but certainly loss of habitat is one factor that they have identified as very important to the 
the plight not only of honeybees but of native bees. And so we have to have to think that we are certainly seeing positive results. Great, thank you. Wonderful. Well, we'll move on. And uh, if you have any other questions, um, please feel free to put them in the Q and A feature, which is at the bottom if you scroll over the screen, and uh, we can ask them at the next uh, question and answer break. So let's move along. Um, so if I have a sense of whether I have space for a, a meadow or um, a pollinator garden, uh, what should I think about planting? Uh, let me spend just a couple minutes talking about answering that in terms of a garden and then the rest of this webinar will really concentrate on the, the meadow type of environment. But if you're planting a garden, you may use many of the same perennials that we're going to use in our meadow and some ornamental grasses as well but you may also be tempted to put in some annuals bulbs and herbs because many gardeners like to to add those in their into their gardens and there's no reason that a garden that is created for pollinators can't also be a garden for humans so we want to in, include your favorite plants but you may make some choices uh, leaning towards those that are good for pollinators so think about spring bulbs as maybe the first pollen sources that bees will have in the spring. So uh, those first warm days in April here in the Northeast, when you start to see bumblebees emerging from their uh, nests and looking for pollen, maybe there's not a lot out there. If you can provide some crocus and some early bulbs, then uh, they will utilize those for sure. You may want to include some annuals in your garden. Um, I've listed some on this slide that are known to be good resources for pollinators, or at least pollinators use them uh, quite often. But in general, the consensus is that annuals are not as good for bees as perennials in terms of the quality of nectar and pollen that is produced. You also should think that we don't have a lot of native annuals at least in the Northeast, that um, have become garden plants. Most of our native annuals are actually weeds, and not things that we would plant in our garden. Um, so think carefully about the annuals if you're gonna, if your primary objective is for a pollinator garden. Herbs also are, are uh, very, very good. Most of these originate in the Mediterranean and uh, because of their coevolution with bees there, if you can let them go to bloom, or at least parts of them let go to bloom, you'll find that you have an awful lot of bee activity on those, both bumblebees, honeybees, and also a lot of the small native bees will be highly attracted to um, these types of herbs. And if you intersperse the herbs in your vegetable garden uh, to attract the pollinators, then you stand a better chance of those bees also visiting your squash and tomatoes and other types of garden plants. So out of curiosity, the uh, picture of the blue flower that you had in the middle on the last slide, what is that? I don't, I'm not Oh, familiar. this one here? Yep. The middle one, that's uh, borage. Oh, okay. All right. It's a very, very good uh, pollinator plant. Okay, great. We also need to uh, think about in a garden, usually we go to the garden center and we buy a variety or a cultivar of a, a plant because we like the way it looks. But try to think about what a bee may be looking for if this is going into a pollinator garden. And the fact that many annuals and perennials have been selected or bred uh, to be pleasing to humans and in that process maybe have inadvertently lost some of the characteristics that make it recognizable or attractive to bees. And so consider the um, Lanceleaf coreopsis as an example here. The upper picture shows the, the native species flower and it's open, very accessible, lots of pollen and nectar resources there. Uh, very, very visible and accessible to bees, whereas the variety on the bottom called Golden Sphere is, is a double, it has double petals, uh, and those petals make it look very different and also cover up and hide a lot of those uh, pollen and nectar resources. So the bees, A, don't see it as easily, and B, have a harder time getting to it. If you've gone to buy uh, cone flowers uh, lately, you'll know that there are now hundreds of different purple cone flower varieties on the market. It's one of the hottest plants in terms of being bred for different flower forms like you see here. 
and a lot of those are not recognizable to bees. I've uh, got some data I won't have time to go into today, but find there's a huge difference in terms of which varieties the bees use or do not use. And so just as a general principle, probably the safest thing to do if your primary objective is to support bees is to stick fairly close to the original flower form um, that the um, genus and species has. Great, that's really useful to know. So, so we're gonna shift, sorry, Jenna, um, mm -hmm. shift back to, to the meadow environment here because this is really the area of my own uh, research here is how do we um, use what space we have to provide the most high quality pollen and nectar sources for bees and other pollinators, uh, pack in a lot of diversity so that we not only have um, flowers in May, but in June, July, September, October, and even into November, uh, for bees and that we have something that meets the the taste preference of all our different native bees out there in an area that's safe and accessible. And we do that by using primarily native species of, of wildflowers uh, that are perennials because we want to plant this and create a long-term self-sustaining little ecosystem that we don't have to put a lot of management or uh, effort into once it's established. We do include warm season grasses in these meadows, similar to a, a tall grass or short grass prairie ecosystem. Not that grasses are used by uh, pollinators for food sources, but they are used for shelter. And while bees are nesting in the ground underneath uh, these plants in the off season, especially the grasses are all often provide good shelter and also a visual marker for the bees so that they can find their, their nest. So if we were going to put together a, a, a design or how what the plants that you the flowers that you'd want to use, I see here you have a species selection chart and some recommendations about mixes and how to choose a mix. And so I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that. Yes. So this is something that's evolved over the ten years I've been working uh, here in New Hampshire on on planting and establishing meadows and have tried many different commercial mixes and uh, making my own mixes and so forth. And, you know, there's no one answer for that. A lot of it depends on your site, and what the light conditions, the soil conditions, the moisture conditions are, uh, because these are things we, again, want to plant uh, that will thrive on your site and not require inputs of fertilizer, water, uh, any pest control and so forth. So the closest we can match the plants that will do well on your site, the best. Usually a meadow mix should consist of 15 to 17 or even 19 different species of wildflowers uh, and two or three species of the warm season grasses. And so what you need to do is find for your region a list such as this of those wildflowers that are good pollinator plants that do well in, in this case, in New England meadows. Um, and I think this list would be pretty good for, you know, New York State and Ohio in um, same climatic zones, as long as you pay attention to your site characteristics. Um, and it is, does look more really like a Midwestern type of a, uh, environment because we don't have a lot of native wildflower meadows in New Hampshire because they tend to grow up into forests very quickly. So we're going to try to arrest that uh, development uh, there. But this type of list uh, is available on my website and perhaps at some other universities and other uh, resources that uh, I've got a small list of additional resources at the end of the slides that I'll be glad to share with you. Can't go into a lot of detail about each plant here, but the more information you have, the better you'll be able to uh, design or select a mix that's appropriate for your site. The other thing, of course, you're concerned about for the pollinators is when these things are in bloom so that you make sure to include flowers uh, or plants that will flower um, from as early in the season as you can get it to as late in the season as you can get them. Uh, and our growing season here in uh, southern New Hampshire basically is going to be 
mid to late May through the end of October or even into November with some of our New England asters. This is called a phenology chart that shows which species are in bloom during which periods of the year. So if you look across the top, each one of these rectangles represents a, a week of the month and then the species are listed down the side. And in this case, the species are ordered by uh, bloom periods. So you can see that starting with golden Alexanders and uh, wild columbine and lupin, those are our earliest wildflowers that we can incorporate here. And then ending up down at the bottom with the esters and, and golden rods in the fall, which are coming into bloom now. Midsummer is a great time. You can use a lot of different uh, species in that in that meadow mix. So there are lots to choose from and it may seem overwhelming but you can choose your favorites almost like a garden or this might help you design a pollinator garden. Just to put some photos to that um, through the seasons here would be our early um, late May to June blooms of lupins and um, golden alexanders, which is related to wild carrot. You might be able to tell from the uh, flower form here. Followed by uh, June blooms of the landslip coreopsis, the yellow flower, and the foxglove uh, beard tongue penstemon here. And the, the bumblebees love these. They delve right into them, as you can see here. Midsummer, lots of things in bloom, and including the wild bergamot or bee balm, and this little uh, large hummingbird moth just flew in here to remind me we're not only talking about bees here, but these types of mixed meadows will certainly support butterflies and uh, moths and beetles and flies and uh, parasitic wasps and all kinds of things, as well as the bees. So it's going to be created to create a habitat that's attractive and resources for many, many different types of pollinators. If you have a wetter site, things like Joe Pie Weed and Blue Vervain shown here will thrive in those wetter areas or even within a meadow that you have, you'll find that things segregate themselves out and choose those niches where they do the best. And of course, uh, here in New England, New England asters and goldenrods are some of the most valuable plants for pollinators uh, to provision their, their winter nests. Oh, can't forget the grasses. Just some pictures here of Indian grass on the left and little blue stem on the right. So these warm season grasses are not our lawn grasses and not our pasture grasses. Those are cool season grasses. Those are all non-native grasses where these are, are uh, native warm season grasses. They do take a little while to get established which is why you don't see them in a lot of my pictures where we have very dense wildflowers. There are many seed mixes available commercially um, and you can certainly choose those and buy those and that may be the easiest way out, but I'm gonna give you some tips on, on how to do that. So if you start with a regional mix uh, based on research such as I've developed here for our area, you can look in a seed catalog and find a mix that contains many of those same species. Most of the seed mixes that are available, especially in big box stores or even garden centers are pretty generic in that they're uh, marketed nationally or regionally, don't have a lot of research behind them. They contain a lot of annuals. Um, my intent is really to, to not include annuals because those are like good for one year and they make you feel good. Uh, they may provide some pollinator habitat that first year, but we want to really think longer term than that. And this is the way you're going to do it is by including these um, good pollinator plants that are perennials. So this is a mix that uh, is posted on my website that I really picked the, the uh, meadow plants that have performed best over the last several years for me and mixed those together and trialed these over and over again. And these are the ones and some suggestions for the, the percentage of what they might be in the mix here. You notice there's two columns here. One's the New Hampshire Prairie Nursery Mix and the other is called the Budget Mix. And the Budget Mix uh, leaves out butterfly milkweed and it leaves out our native lupin because those are really, really expensive components of our mix. And so if you're on a limited budget, especially on a large scale, uh, you may need to make some sacrifices here. 
And so what are the, I, I was going to say, starting talking about uh, cost, what can, it, can someone expect to pay to, for a meadow mix uh, plant? Yeah. yeah, so for a good mix, that's um, probably 50 to 60% wildflowers and the rest grasses, you would expect to pay about $50 just for the seed uh, to, to uh, sow per thousand square feet, or that comes out to like 1500 to $3,000 an acre, depending on whether you have those uh, selected species in there and what your seeding rate's going to be. So this is where, um, you know, somebody can help you figure out what the proper seeding rate is and the proper mix and what your budget is. But as you can tell, it's not an inexpensive thing. And that's why it's so important to choose things that are going to be successful. So we're not buying a bunch of expensive seed that is not going to be successful. Since we don't have a lot of New England regional seed mixes available to us, just because we don't have those, those native meadows that provide the, the regional ecotypes for us to do a lot of seed collection, we need to look to the Midwest and, and Mid-Atlantic states in order to um, get wildflower seed. And so some of the nurseries that or seed houses that specialize in wildflower mixes and have lots and lots of choices or you can buy the individual seeds and mix them yourself are um, listed here. And um, I'm not gonna go spend time on this, but you can come back and find these uh, resources later on. Great. I think you have some on that next slide too. When people, yeah. can, when people can look at this, these slide sets uh, later. Yeah. So, and so a lot of people always want to know, well, can I get regional ecotypes? And the answer is probably not if you're looking for seed. Um, but these are places you can check. These are may have some, some years, but certainly not in large quantities. Great. Well, uh, Nancy, uh, I see that there's a lot of questions coming in in the Q&A feature, so uh, would, um, I'll unmute you and um, do you want to pick a couple of questions to ask Kathy. Sure. Uh, I'm going to ask sort of a combined uh, question. Uh, people are having issues with where they started a, a, a mat flower meadow and now it's been overtaken by goldenrod or it's been overtaken by stilt grass questions of invasives. Can you talk a little bit about how to control those kinds of things? Uh, I will touch on that uh, as we get into the, the maintenance end of things. But first, I guess I'd like to, to kind of go through the, the process slides um, here. But let me say that, first of all, when you're selecting a site, try to find a site that isn't already, you know, colonized by invasives. Invasives will come in uh, because the birds are going to love these meadows as well, and they're going to drop seed in there. But as long as you can get this density that I keep talking about, those invasives find a very hard time getting established. It's when you have disturbed soils and open soils for them uh, that they tend to um, be able to colonize, unless they're already there, and then you're Kind of fighting a losing battle, I hate to say it. But one other comment on that question is that, that uh, maybe you should learn to value the, the uh, goldenrod. In fact, goldenrod has been identified here in the Northeast as probably the most valuable uh, wildflower species in our environment for pollinators. Um, the trouble is that the uh, Canada goldenrod is rhizomatous and it tends to colonize and take over. Um, but there are several other species of goldenrod that aren't as assertive or aggressive. And so when we're planting our meadow and choosing our mix, we'll uh, choose to use those instead of the Canada goldenrod. Um, but if you're just gonna like go to a, a reduced mowing schedule and not plant and you've started with a field situation and that that native goldenrod's gonna come in and it is going to kind of take over. So it's gonna be tough to get the diversity that we're talking about in, unless you start with a uh, intended planting mix. Okay, I'm gonna ask a pollinator question now. I've heard some people say that bumblebees aren't good pollinators, would you agree? No, bumblebees are excellent pollinators. Um, in fact, they can pollinate some things that, that other bees can't, such as tomatoes. Uh, and lupin that have a, a pretty closed flower. Bumblebees being big and strong can get, get up in there in those flowers 
and they do a thing called buzz pollination, which is a special uh, vibration that they have that causes pollen to be released um, instead of sticking to the, the anthers. And so it gets released and it co coats the bumblebees and then they carry it to the next flower. So bumblebees are known to be excellent pollinators. Should I ask one more? Or are we yep, out of yep, time? We have time for another one, yes. Uh, do seed mixes need cold stratification before planting? Um, most of the, the seed companies that I have referenced here will have already done a dry stratification, um, but we're going to talk about fall as probably the best season for planting these things. And one reason is that because that, that cold exposure during the window, winter will enhance the germination of wildflower seeds. Uh, otherwise, you can do a refrigerated uh, cold stratification period, but the uh, seed specialists, the seed companies are the best source of information and they, they make that readily available on which species need how many days of cold at what temperature. Well, thank you, Nancy. And we'll come back. We have time for more questions uh, later on as well. But it sounds like a lot of people are anxious to hear about uh, how to maintain a wildflower meadow so it doesn't get overtaken by one species. So let's dive into that and yeah. uh, learn, learn about that from you. Okay, so let's talk briefly again about site selection. Um, protection from pesticides, of course, is fundamental if you're creating a pollinator garden in an agricultural or garden setting. These are gonna do best in open space with full sun. Many of the species will tolerate uh, partial shade, um, but not only do the plants prefer full sun, the bees prefer full sun. Poor soil is okay. You don't have to have any special, you know, fertile, high nutrient or even any particular pH range. Um, you can match your plant selection to the, the soil characteristics. People ask how big is a minimum? I say probably 400 to 500 square feet. So 20 by 20 or so is a minimum. That will give you enough room to get all these species established and interacting with each other. And also they help hold each other up. These things you can probably tell from the photos tend to get fairly tall and leggy. Uh, and they will knit together in a, in a situation like this and help hold each other up. Further, one more tip would be to consider your viewscape, like maybe uh, these don't look quite as nice as this um, all year round. Um, and also towards the end of the summer when they are getting old and senescing, they can turn brown and fall over and things. And so maybe you don't want them as the focal point when you're looking out your living room window. Maybe they look a little better from um, several, several meters away. So just a tip there. So let's talk about if we're going to start with something like this, which was just a, a rough mown uh, turf, not, not a highly maintained or manicured lawn or anything, but this is what I started with and I think would be typical of the type of uh, land that one may be thinking, oh, I don't want to keep mowing this all the time. It's not really doing any good. Let's convert this to a, a pollinator meadow. So how do we do that? We want to change it from this to this. It's not that easy, but it is certainly possible. And the answer is not this, okay? So you may have a seed packet fall out of your cereal box that says, here, plant me, I'm a bee garden, or I'm gonna you know, support pollinators by planting the seed mix. But if you just take that seed mix out and plant and maybe till up your ground and sprinkle this seed on there, it's really not going to be very successful. A, because it's mostly annuals in most of those mixes, and B, because you haven't done an adequate job of site preparation. So this is probably the, the most important slide in, in my whole talk here. If you take one thing away from this is you need to be patient. And you need to consider that this establishment of a, a beautiful, dense, diverse wildflower meadow is a three-year process. It doesn't happen you know, by deciding today that you want to do it and tomorrow going out and planting it. The first season should be sent, spent killing existing vegetation, okay? Because these wildflowers just, the first year when they come up, they don't get very big, they don't flower, they're not very competitive with uh, especially our grasses, our 
lawn grasses or our pasture grasses or our weed grasses, and they're just not going to survive if we don't do a good job of getting rid of those things before we plant them. So common strategies and methods that you can use to do that, and I'll talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of those. One, of course, will be to use non-selective herbicides, as shown in this bottom photo here, um, to kill existing vegetation. But even that, you probably need to do two to three times over the course of the growing season prior to planting, so that by the time you plant, you have a clean slate, basically. The second method would be repeated tillage. In other words, coming in and, and tilling um, the vegetation that's there, that's shown uh, here in this strip. Uh, and again, it would need to be repeated so that um, by turning over the ground, uh, exposed rhizomes and plant material will die, but other ones will re-sprout and seeds will sprout. And so you'll need to do it again and perhaps like three times over the course of a, a growing season in order to do that. Disadvantage is that you are continuously bringing up new weed seeds and exposing them to conditions where they will germinate. So this really is not proven to be a, really the best practice. Third one is smothering or light exclusion. That is the use of black plastic or some other uh, material that excludes light from uh, germinating seeds or uh, grasses or anything trying to re-sprout from a rhizome under there. And if they can't get light, they can't photosynthesize, eventually they run out of energy and they die. That requires leaving that uh, mulch material on for probably three months. I say mid-June to early September is ideal in our area. And so uh, scalp the grass, put the plastic down and leave it on all season. And when you remove it, you will have a very nice planting bed ready to go. The fourth method mentioned is solarization. A lot of people mix this up with the use of black plastic, but it actually acts by a different mechanism. So this is the year of use of clear plastic. Uh, and this clear plastic has to be uh, buried along the edges. What we're trying to do is build up heat under that clear plastic to the point where it gets so hot that it kills existing weeds and kills uh, weed seeds that are in the upper surfaces of the soil. Traditionally, this has worked well in areas with um, hot, arid climates such as Israel, Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, and so forth and has not been a, a real successful in the Northeast, but more and more people are starting to uh, use this uh, for better or worse. And I'll show you some of my results in a minute. And the last method I'm just gonna mention, but um, is to use cover crops. So maybe you come in and you till the soil in the spring and then maybe seed it with a crop of buckwheat, uh, which can create a dense cover and smother out a lot of weeds as they try to come up during the summer, then you mow the buckwheat down, let it decompose and, and seed um, following that. So again, one of these methods an entire season. This slide's gonna show you the results of that uh, experiment that was on the right side in the last slide. So in 2017, I spent the entire growing season um, and had a replicated trial out with these eight uh, methods of site preparation uh, and you can see that the first four were on tilled soil. So we took that rough turf grass, we tilled those plots, and then we either applied clear plastic, black plastic, we did the herbicide spot spray as stuff came up, or we did repeat till it. The second set of four uh, treatments were not tilled first. They were simply scalped or mowed as close as possible and then had those treatments applied to them. So I'm gonna show you the results um, as of this year. So after the um, site prep treatments were completed last fall, like a year ago, uh, I seeded with my meadow mix um, in November. And so things started to come up this spring and I've done the evaluations. And as of last week, this is what I've got. So let me just point out a couple things on this graph without spending too much time. Notice that the bars are the treatment numbers here, one through eight, which match with the key here. And every bar adds up to 100%. That means that 100% of the ground right now is covered. There is no bare ground showing at this point in the season, either with the wildflowers, uh, grasses, 
which in this case are primarily uh, weeds. They're not the grasses that we planted. Those really don't establish for two or three years after planting. And then of course, we also have some plots where there are broadleaf weeds like um, uh, red sorrel and um, oxalis and things like that. So, Kathy, can I just interrupt yes, you for a second? Sure. I'm conscious of time. And so I'm just thinking that if somebody uh, wants to find out some more detail about this, uh, that they could contact you about that. Maybe we can give people the broad overview of, uh, of the maintenance and um, after planting. And, and if you want to just point out the highlights of this, that would be great. Right. Um, so, these slides will be available for you to come back, but I'm going to say don't use this one slide as necessarily the basis for your decision. I need to evaluate these plots over three years before I draw my conclusions. But right now, the three that have the brighter gold bars, because they have the highest percentage of wildflowers, means that they're more successfully becoming established than the others. And you can see that um, what those are by matching them up here on, on the right side. Um, so I again, I just want to emphasize the point that this is probably the most important part of, of the whole process, although it's not the sexiest part of the process. Um, this is going to determine your, your success in the long run. So once you have a good uh, site preparation, you should have basically bare ground such as this to plant in. And fall is a good time to plant. Um, I have done all my seeding by hand. I mix my seed with moist vermiculite as a carrier. The tiny seed sticks to the vermiculite. The vermiculite gives me something I can see so I can spread it air, uh, around in the area and get a good uh, distribution of it. Uh, you should then um, probably rake it lightly to just work it into the ground a little bit, but you don't want to bury it. Most of the seed needs to be exposed, but rolling it either with a lawn roller or a cultipacker such as this is very good. That will press it into the ground and get what we call good soil to seed contact. Then you can spread mulch over the top, a uh, clean straw or salt marsh hay if you're in an area that you can get that works very well, a bale per thousand square feet, just to help hold the seed in place over the winter. If you don't get to your fall planting, it snows in October or something, uh, you can still plant that seed as early in the spring as you can get to it and it will be fine. You can also consider using plugs or small transplants if you're only doing a small small meadow like a 20 by 20. There's some advantages and disadvantages to that. Major disadvantages being that it's much more expensive, about six times more per thousand square feet. It's more work. You need to provide water to get these things established. Uh, and it may be hard to get the, the mixture of plants that you want unless you want to grow them yourself. So most of what we're talking about from the um, establishing a meadow is going to be from a seed mix because it's so much more inexpensive. So you do need to do a little bit besides plant. So you planted last fall, the next spring these things are going to come up and you're going to be disappointed. Okay, this is my take home message is year one, expect to be disappointed. It's going to look like a weed patch. The wildflowers are not going to be in bloom except for black-eyed Susan, which you see here. So definitely include that in your mix. That will flower the first year. But you're going to get a lot of weeds, even having done good site preparation. And so we recommend a midsummer mowing over the top of germinating wildflowers. Uh, don't worry about cutting the black-eyed Susans back. They will branch and come back into bloom. So either you might have crabgrass, like you see on the left side here, which is really got to smother out wildflowers if you allow it to, uh, or you may have a situation where you have a lot of field weeds like this, and you can see that we're being fairly ruthless in terms of mowing at four to six inches, but those wildflowers are underneath that level at that point. So here we're talking uh, early July is the timing for this. So that may be what it looks like year one, but if you can get through that and not plow it under because it looks so terrible, uh, in year two, after planting, you'll get lots of black-eyed Susans and some other things starting to come into bloom like this. Uh, but it's really going to be that third year after planting that you get that diversity and really the, the beauty and aesthetics that you are uh, looking for.
and I'm going to show you one more sequence because this is really important. Here's a here's my um, strips where I'd done the black plastic um, for the season prior to planting in the fall. Uh, the next uh, spring and June, it looks like a weed patch. I'm disappointed. I'm ready to plow it under. And August, even though I mowed in July, it still looks terrible. I'm disappointed. My boss is mad. Why am I making this look like a mess? Um, but you got to be patient and prepared for that. Fast forward a year into June, things are starting to look pretty good. Now, the majority of what you see growing here is wildflowers. The first to bloom, uh, coming into bloom in June. And then in uh, July, you've got more flowers and more diversity and um, so on. So consider three years after that point, you're home free. Um, you've mowed in the, in the first season during midsummer. After you have an established meadow, you don't want to mow during the summer. You would only mow to tidy things up uh, in late fall or early spring, such as you see here. Um, you could do this with a weed eater if that's the implement that you have. You want to do it high so you're not ripping the crowns out of the ground. Uh, wait until the plants have died down. Um, and the longer you can wait in the season, the more value you're giving to wildlife and, and pollinators. You don't have to rake this debris off. You can leave it sitting there. Um, note here the no cut out invasive plants by hand. As soon as you see any bittersweet vine or um, stilt grass or anything coming in that is going to be a problem, uh, get that out of there. Otherwise, I tolerate many of just the common weeds, but if you create a dense planting, most of those will be minimal. So this looks pretty bad at the end of, of November here on the bottom right, but the next spring by late April, you'd be amazed at how quickly these wildflower plants will grow back up and, and come into bloom for you. And if you've done your job well to that point, then um, you are in good shape uh, to get this type of, of meadow and you can just continue to enjoy it from uh, spring through every season at this point. Beautiful, thank you. Well, we have a few minutes left and um, I'm going to suggest, um, I know there's lots of questions and uh, maybe uh, Kathy would be gracious enough to answer some electronically after this. And, um, but what I'm going to suggest is beautiful to watch these video, uh, the photographs of the change in the season. Um, if we want to maybe skip to some resources, because I know people will be interested in that. And, um, and then there's a couple of housekeeping uh, slides that I have um, about getting the recording um, the IPM Center. So, and uh, it sounds like there's a lot of interest. Maybe we can invite Kathy back in the spring uh, to color. Uh, she had some beautiful slides about um, how the uh, bees see the world and how pollinators see the world, which is fascinating. So maybe we could have her come back in the spring and cover that and answer some more questions um, once you've had time to digest uh, this session. So what are some resources that you have for people, uh, Kathy, who, are, who want to look into this some more? There are zillions of resources out there. If you Google pollinators or bees or whatever, you'll get zillions of them. These are just like my three top top favorites, besides, of course, your local extension um, service, whatever resources they have available. Um, down at the bottom here, xerces.org, pollinatorgardens.org, and the great sunflower.org, which is a citizen science project, um, and also a lot of uh, tracking things in, in real time. And also at the top, you see the, the link to my own web page, which would look like this if you uh, pulled it up here. And a lot of the information that I've discussed today is available there. And I'll continue to post more as it becomes available. Perfect, lovely. And if you could scroll slides forward, there's a couple of things I want to point out to people. Is, um, there is, um, uh, sorry, there was a phone in the background there. Uh, we have a Find a Colleague site, uh, so to aid uh, collaboration in the Northeast between people who are interested in IPM. So you can put a profile about yourself, what you're interested in, in collaborating on, and also find people who might also might be interested in the same topic uh, as you. Um, there's also going to be the archive of today's webinar, and Kathy, if you can just move the slide forward, people will see that. 
uh, there is the link. It's uh, if you just go to our main web page, it should be pretty easy to find. It won't be there today. It take, takes us a few uh, days to edit it, but if you come back next week. And also we have some other webinars coming up. And uh, Kathy, if you can scroll forward for me, there you go. So tomorrow at the same time, we've got a webinar about spotted lanternfly, latest research. It's a new invasive species that is in uh, Pennsylvania and moving. Um, and on Thursday, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, climate smart farming uh, tools and practices. There's some really interesting um, online tools that people can use um, in light of uh, climate shifting. And uh, next Tuesday, we have um, a seminar on uh, uh, pest management and no-till corn silage systems uh, with an introduction to the Northeast SER and their programs and their funding program. And um, I know Kathy, uh, we also have our RFA um, came out yesterday. Our deadline is November 15th. So for those of you who are looking for funding for a research project or communications project or a working group, actually this um, uh, presentation came out of um, a working group that we funded in pollinators uh, several years ago. And I know, Kathy, you have uh, some acknowledgements of, of uh, places where uh, this uh, project was funded. And, um, and you have a vegan bee saying thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Terrific. Lovely. Well, thank you, everybody, for, um, for your participation. And uh, we'll do our very best to actually get the flurry of questions that came in uh, answered for you if we didn't have uh, time and we'll, we'll invite Kathy back because I can tell there's uh, uh, There's lots of interest in the topic uh, that, that she covers and hopefully she'll she'll graciously say yes to do that So so thank you Kathy for all the time and thoughtfulness and really the career that has gone into creating this presentation I know um, it's valuable for a lot of people and uh, I appreciate the, the your time and attention and how carefully you uh, you took care of us all today. So thank you. Thank you. All right. And uh, with that, I will end the webinar. And, uh, and thank you, everybody, for your participation. Hello. Welcome back. Well, this is uh, Planting Wildflower Meadows for Pollinator Habitat, uh, part two. Um, since there's some wonderful content that we didn't get to and also some wonderful questions. And so Kathy has very graciously offered to uh, cover some really great material on um, seeing the world through uh, a bee's perspective and uh, what pollinators like and some really interesting research on their preferences. And uh, then we're also going to take some time to answer some wonderful questions that came through. So hopefully you'll get everything that you need to uh, plant your and maintain your wildflower meadow. So, Kathy, if you want to take us away with uh, what, do, what does a bee see? What is their perspective? Right. So we tend to look at the meadow as this large, expansive, beautiful mixture of colors and textures and plants. But if you try to think like a bee and think about what this little bee approaching this um, pale purple coneflower, Echinacea pallida, uh, which is, by the way, one of my favorite plants, uh, what, is, what is this bee looking for? What does she see? What are those cues that she's going to use to decide whether to land on this flower? And the, whether it would be a good resource for her to uh, either sip some nectar, nectar or collect some pollen to take back for her uh, larvae. Of course, many flowers such as this one are composites, which instead of being actually one flower, each one of these things we call a flower is made up of hundreds of individual uh, little florets in this cone of the cone flower. And at any given time, only a couple of those are going to be open and providing nectar through the nectaries or pollen, which you can actually see as, as very small yellow um, areas within these. So that's one thing that she's looking for is to find those flowers within this flower that are providing those those resources. So I'm not an entomologist, uh, I'm a plant scientist, but I have looked into the literature to try and find out how well do bees see and what kind of cues do they use to decide what flowers that they want to land and feed on. Is it primarily visual cues such as color and size? 
how important is floral density? In other words, how many flowers do you have to have in a group for them to notice it and come explore further? Uh, is height a factor or size of the flowers in terms of diameter? Uh, one thing they do know is that nectar guides are often very important. So these are the little lines or patterns you often see on a, a flower, which may be look pale purple to us, for example, but these are like like runway lights, they help uh, guide the uh, bee or other pollinator to find the, the nectaries and the uh, exposed anthers. And then they also would be using non-visual cues such as fragrance and the fragrance of a, a flower as a whole, which we can often detect, but not always, uh, may be quite different than the actual odor of the pollen from that same flower and bees can apparently uh, tell the odor of the pollen as something different than the odor that's formed by the, uh, the nectar and the other floral parts. They also might taste and see if they like the taste of something. Um, and primarily that's gonna be a response to the sucrose concentration, sugar concentration in the nectar there. And then they'll decide either they like it or don't like it and explore further. And there's a question about whether they can actually monitor the nutritional value of the uh, pollen, for example, the protein and the pollen uh, before they collect a bunch of it and take it back to the nest. And right now the current thinking is probably they don't do that on the fly, but they may get some feedback uh, from the, uh, the colony if it's a social bee such as a honeybee or a bumblebee uh, to let them know whether they like that pollen source and go get more or just forget that one and find something better. And finally, uh, electrical field seems to be a factor. And so these bees as they're flying along and encountering these flowers close up may be able to detect a, a very small uh, weak electrical field which would attract them to certain flowers or parts of flowers. So what we know about bee vision, and this is nothing that, that I can personally take claim for developing, but um, the entomologists have determined that bees cannot see the color red. And so if you look back at my phenology chart, you'll notice there were very few red flowers in that chart. And in our, in our meadow, most of the colors seem to be yellow and purple and pink. Uh, and so and blue, uh, because those are the colors that bees can actually see. Uh, red, however, is detected by hummingbirds and butterflies, and orange by butterflies, and so they may be attracted to the color red, whereas you wouldn't choose that color if you were trying to attract bees. Bees can see, however, in an ultraviolet spectrum that humans cannot see. And so there's some really interesting um, pictures uh, available on the web. If you just Google bee vision, you'll find some of these. Uh, here's just an example of a marsh marigold. And the picture on the left is what we as humans see. see and we see it as a, you know, a yellow flower with yellow uh, anthers and stamens and not much too exciting in terms of a pattern there. But using UV photographer, photography, uh, the researcher has shown us in the middle what, what that would look like uh, to a bee in terms of patterns. And you can see that now it's got much more of a, a guide for the bees to direct them to where those resources are gonna be collected. And the third picture is actually a, a color shift to uh, what they consider would be the equivalent of bee vision in terms of color. So we've taken the, the patterns in the UV range and shifted the spectrum. And so those black uh, patterns in the center one now appear uh, green, whereas we couldn't detect them at all uh, in our vision. And this type of work uh, resulted in an interesting article over here in 2017 um, about how, how bees do see these halos or, or markings that we cannot see. So I just think that's really interesting because I spend a lot of time looking uh, at flowers and to me they look like this, but to a bee they look totally uh, different. So um, we try to figure out, you know, in this meadow mix, if we're creating a pollinator habitat, what are the best pollinator plants to include in that mix? 
I'm going to actually click this to make it a video. And as you watch this, you'll notice a few things. One is the great amount of bee and insect activity within this uh, patch, and that's fairly typical when you have this dense of a planting. You have not only your, your bumblebees, maybe you see some honeybees in there. There are also large carpenter bees and small carpenter bees and mining bees and sweat bees uh, and all kinds of little bees in there. And they don't all share the same preferences for, for what they're feeding on. Uh, the choices depend on the flower structure, the size, the fragrance, the color, the mass, and not all flowers are designed uh, anatomically for all bees. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that some flowers take big bees to, to get down in them and uh, pollinate them, and other ones like some of these are very exposed uh, and accessible to small bees, and even what they call short-tongued bees, which means they don't have uh, much of a mouth part to, to delve into things. One thing you might also notice is the um, what we call floral constancy. Once a, a bee determines that it likes a flower, for example, this um, bergamot or bee balm here, this is a native species of bee balm, uh, it tends to continue to feed and go down and find more and more of the same flower instead of shifting up to the uh, yellow cone flower over to the Joe pie weed or find something else, it tends to stick with something and that's called floral constancy. And that may last for one trip out from the nest or it may last for a day. Uh, and so there's this question about how bees learn and how long they retain learning. Uh, and so that's another interesting but unresolved question. It seems that honeybees of course have a very complicated communication system and tend to have very strong floral constancy so that all the bees are going to the same types of flowers when they go out foraging on a day. But these other small bees may only remember that for a short period of time and then next time they go out they'll uh, try some different flowers and choose to, to um, concentrate on those for a different, different foraging trip. And this results in um, this idea that, that generalist bees need a diversity of pollen and floral resources as being the most healthy diet for them instead of uh, constantly all, all feeding on the same thing all the time, that diversity is good just like it is for most humans and animals. So we spent um, quite a bit of time in the last few years actually monitoring pollinator visits to different types of flowers, um, both in the mixed meadow and in, in controlled plots. And here you see a, a grad student doing a um, timed count. And so we, she would stand there for five minutes and count the number of which type of bees comes to visit this clump of um, bee balm or bergamot that she's got uh, outlined with a, a hoop of a known size. And then we uh, do that repeatedly uh, over and over again um, and with different flowers that are in bloom synchronously uh, and do it over a period of time so that we have a robust data set. And the graph just shows you the results from a certain time period in uh, summer of 2015 when the flowers listed at the bottom were all in bloom. And so the bees and pollinators had these choices to make. And I think two interesting things that you can pick up immediately from this graph is that some flowers are much more popular than others. Uh, for, for example, the Agastache or Lavender Hyssop attracted a lot of bees, um, up to about 16, 17 visits per five minutes within that hoop area. And the other one which was really popular was uh, Ironweed or Vernonia. And the colors on these bars uh, separate out the types of bees. So the blue bars are bumblebees, the olive green is honeybees, there's a red for carpenter bees, the purple is for other small native bees since they're so small and hard to identify, we lump those together. And then uh, butterflies and moths is the orange and then other like flies or wasps or just unknowns would go into that category. And so what I want to point out here real quickly is that different bees have different preferences. So a flower such as um, the yellow coneflower um, isn't the most popular um, flower in terms of total number of bee visits, 
but it's very important and because it's accessible to a lot of those small bees. So this purple bar here. And honeybees also did make some use of it, but it wasn't their favorite uh, either. But notice the absence of honeybees on this. They just really did not care for this um, at all. Um, and same with, with butterflies and moths, very few would, would land on those types of things. So I think this just points out the different species of bees will have different um, preferences for flowers. And again, the importance of diversity if we want to plant pollinator meadows and support all pollinator species. What I see from that is I would not want to pl uh, plant monada or bee balm because of the carpenter bee attractant, which I wouldn't want right next to my house. <laughs> well, again, you wouldn't plant these right next to your house, probably, um, but that large carpenter bee does nest in dead wood, and so houses can be candidates for dead wood. Uh, the best thing to do, and this question usually comes up, is to make sure that that wood is well painted or well varnished, and then that uh, serves as a detractant for them. But, you know, if you put this this meadow or whatever out into, um, you know, your back 40 or whatever, it's not going to impact the structures nearby. So I just want to go back to this slide that I showed earlier and said to be cautious with cultivars because of all the breeding and a selection which has changed the flower form, but that's not the only factor involved. And so this was actually uh, a 2017 trial that I did, and I had these eight cultivars of purple cone flower here, uh, and did the timed counts um, to see which which uh, cultivars were most visited by bees. And we're making the assumption here that if they're most visited, they're probably the most um, the best floral resources for bees. Um, so here's our eight cultivars here, and everybody could look at those and say, well, which ones do you think are going to be most attractive to bees? I already gave you a little hint that maybe some of these highly modified ones with double petals are not the most attractive. Uh, and I imply that maybe the original species, such as Echinacea purpurea grown from seed, might be the most uh, attractive. Um, but that's not necessarily always true, and so that's why we need to do this research on um, many, many different cultivars and see. And here's the results of um, last year's uh, combined data on that. And again, you can see that different bees had different preferences, but that the Echinacea purpurea straight species was not uh, the most attractive in terms of attracting the most numbers of bees to it. And there was no one species that preferred it over some of the others. So really the most uh, attractive in terms of bee visits was Magnus, which is a selection and very similar in flower form and color uh, to Echinacea purpurea. But there must be something about it that maybe it has a higher sugar content or smells better or whatever, one of these other cues that causes the bees to like it even better. Whereas many of these highly modified forms uh, were not as attractive to bees as, as the Magnus or even the white swan, which is a white uh, cultivar. Um, so honeybees, they like this powwow wild berry, which is a pretty new variety, um, but bumblebees didn't like that much at all. And nobody liked the highly modified lemon cream or hot playa ones. Uh, and bumblebees really like the, the Magnus and the white swan uh, best. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things, either you, you have to know this and choose your favorite bee and what you're trying to plant for your favorite bee, or goes, go with those that just simply attracted the most uh, types of bees. And I think that is my last actual slide, if you want to follow up with some questions. Yeah, we, we have some questions. Um, so um, here we go. I, I see, see me and see you, so that's great. <laughs> um, all right, so we have some wonderful questions, and I'll, um, we've kind of ordered them a little bit uh, with uh, what they're speaking of. And the first set of questions are about establishing um, uh, your pollinator meadow or garden. So I'm going to read them because they're great questions. So. The first is, my yard is overgrown with weeds, somewhat intentionally, as I've seen that they attract many insects, so I just leave them be. However, I want to have as uh, fully a native garden as possible, and I also want to tidy up the yard a bit without removing the native plants. 
do the weeds tend to be native? That would be nice if we could make that generalization, but on the whole, I'm gonna to have to say no. Um, and thinking of your most common lawn and garden weeds, um, and lawns, dandelions, clover, uh, crabgrass, none of those are, are native, uh, but neither are lawn grasses. So we're dealing with a totally non-native system there. I'm going to say that in general, I don't think our native annuals are as uh, competitive as the things that have become really successful weeds. And so maybe that's why we can't say that, it, that weeds tend to be native. Not that there aren't any native weeds, but um, we can't make that, that generalization. Okay, all right, thank you. And you mentioned the phenology chart and you also had um, a list of, um, um, of, of plants. But someone who asked is, is there a decision tool on the web to help make place-based place planting decisions? Yeah, um, good, good question. So one of the resources that I had mentioned was xerces.org. And they have many, many excellent publications and resources all available online. You may have to hunt a little bit, but uh, for example, there is a pollinator habitat uh, assessment worksheet that they have there that you, know, you can use to actually assess what you currently have um, that's providing you know, good nesting sites and forage sites and so forth for pollinators so that then you would know what to improve. They also have regional plant lists and recommendations um, so that you can find this kind of uh, regional approach to um, making some decisions about what plants are best for your area. And they often will ask you questions about your site characteristics, moisture, soil type, and so forth. Okay. Terrific, thank you. Are there any examples where these plantings are established adjacent to agricultural fields? If yes, what is the best design for supporting pollinators and other beneficials in terms of natural enemies of the pest species? Yes, um, there are many, many farms who are establishing pollinator habitat and that is being encouraged um, through incentives, uh, especially through the uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service, which is a federal USDA agency, but it's in every, every state, so you can find them uh, online or, or by phone. Uh, locally and ask about their their uh, incentives, but also their guidelines. And they have formed a partnership with Xerces Society so that they have the expertise of Xerces um, behind them. And their primary target audience is agricultural uh, fields because that's the purpose of NRCS and USDA is to support agriculture. Um, so typically these are um, fairly simple uh, plantings. They can certainly be a mixed meadow like we've been talking about here and Xerces and NRCS have some of their own mixes that tend to be maybe only five or seven species to make them very simple. Um, and the procedures are much the same as I talked about this morning in terms of you know, doing your site preparation and then uh, fall planting if possible. Um, I guess the bigger difference is that there isn't usually the attention to weeds or maintenance on a farm where these are just off in the distance for pollinator habitat and they're not really trying to establish anything for aesthetics. They may be perfectly happy to, to have, you know, 50% weeds in those patches as long as there are also flowers for bees. But uh, certainly it's something to look into if, if someone has a farm and is um, willing to do that, they will cost share the cost of establishment. Okay, actually it kind of leads into the next question. Um, are there any programs available to provide incentives or other support to promote the establishment of such natural ecosystems to sustain pollinators in the larger scale? So you've mentioned NRCS and Xerces, is there other places people should look as well? Uh, no, those are the only ones I'm familiar with. Um, it's possible in other regions of the country or states, there may be some more local uh, incentives, but 
Um, just to be clear, the incentive comes from NRCS, not through Xerces. Uh, Xerces is a nonprofit, but um, uh, NRCS programs are available to private landowners. And so even if you don't have a farm, if you're a private landowner, and I know some forest, uh, forestry tree farm owners who have used that, but they will not fund uh, nonprofits like conservation commissions. They, you know, they would support that, but it's not their mission. Okay, all right, good to know, thank you. Um, do you have thoughts on using species native to a local region uh, under a one to 200 mile radius versus a larger native area of several states? <laughs> Yeah, this is a, you know, this whole idea of what, it, what is native and how local does native have to be. I think it really depends on your objectives and also the availability of, of plants native to your specific area. Here in New Hampshire, we really don't, if we had to rely on plants native to within 100 miles of here, I probably could only have half the number of species in my um, meadow mix as I do if I consider that if something's native to the broader New England uh, northeastern region and has proven itself not to become invasive when introduced into the area then um, that gives me much more um, in terms of tools to work with and the generalist species of pollinators uh, are quite happy with you know non-native plants and again if we go back to our lawn weeds dandelions and clover are very very attractive and and good support for pollinators if you can let those grow in your lawn but they're totally non-native but the idea that bees will only that native bees will only feed on native plants is not true except for those very specialist uh, relationships so I think we have to just really consider the situation and if you're in an environmentally sensitive uh, area, you want to err on the side of caution and use more local natives. Uh, but if you're a farm, which again is a non-native uh, ecosystem or, you know, a garden where you're already planting a lot of non-natives, then uh, the question becomes a little less important. All right, lovely, thank you. So uh, this is a great question. Uh, what can I start doing now since I've already missed this year's growing season? Well, you can uh, go online and either order or download, download the wildflower seed catalogs and that will give you many hours of pleasure uh, throughout the winter. Um, and you can even place your order. But uh, as I said previously, you're really much better off to think about next year how you're going to do the site preparation and kill existing uh, species and then order your seed and plant a year from now than you are to try to start anything right now. Okay, great. Um, should full seeding ideally be done after the first hard frost? Mm -hmm. That's, that is uh, called a frost seeding if you do that. And I think it's a, a good cue that it's time to do it. I, it's not necessary to wait that late. I have seeded as early as um, mid-September and as late as December 1st. And so I think more importantly is when, when is the, the site prepared? When is the weather uh, allowing you to get out there? Uh, the soil not too wet when you spread the seed, of course, because you're gonna do some, some operations to it. You don't wanna be compacting it and tracking the seed around and things like that. So, the idea is not that the seed will germinate this fall, it's that you're putting it out there and it's ready to germinate as soon as spring conditions are ready for it. Uh, the danger being if you seed too early, you might get some of the easy species like black-eyed Susan to germinate. So I think waiting until you know October 1st in the, in the uh, Northeast is a good practice, but any time between then and December 1st really is fine. Okay, thank you. So this is a kind of a big uh, overview question, but how is climate change affecting pollinators? Is it documented? And what's being done to mitigate some of the impact? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, really not my area of expertise or research, but I know that um, entomologists and uh, ecologists are documenting that there are you know, shifts in species ranges, including in, in pollinators and our own UNHB lab here has um, provided some evidence for 
um, even the uh, extinction of certain bee species over the last hundred years that they believe is due to climate change. Um, in terms of mitigation, I, I really think that just planting and providing uh, increased habitat and reducing the fragmentation of habitat so that the, the bee populations can shift as climate changes is probably our best strategy. Okay, thank you. And now we're going to switch into, we have some questions about managing uh, plots and quite a few people seem to have uh, uh, had plots and then had problems uh, keeping, keeping it going. So we're gonna dive into some of those. Um, so the first question is, do you have to mow the meadow after it's established or can you leave it alone? Okay, so after established in my mind means after that third year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at that point you don't have to mow it every year, but you're probably going to want to mow it uh, at least every other year. And the primary purpose of doing that is to prevent woody trees and shrubs from coming up and turning it into a forest. And so we're trying to arrest succession so that it remains a meadow instead of instead of becoming a forest. And that's the primary reason for mowing. Other than that, you don't have to, no. Okay, all right. Okay, and then I'm gonna read uh, this, uh, uh, what someone had written. About 20 years ago, I converted a little over an acre of lawn around my house into a wildlife habitat. About six years ago, I created a wildflower meadow that covered about 20% of that. Bees, wasps, butterflies, etc., appeared in large numbers and it was beautiful. And the bats were very happy too. Since uh, then, the wildflower meadow has reverted to the usual weeds that uh, th uh, thrive in Pennsylvania, where I live. I need to restart the cycle. Unfortunately, we're being invaded by stilt grass, and it's spreading fast and taking over the landscape. I missed the deadline for cutting it down before the grass reaches uh, seed maturity in August. What advice can you offer? I'm thinking about sowing buckwheat, as it may have a chance to successfully compete with the stilt grass but I'm not conv convinced that will work. Yeah, that's a really tough situation. And, and I don't know if buckwheat would uh, be competitive with, with stilt grass or not. I think it's certainly uh, worth a try as an interim um, crop. If you have enough stilt grass and other weeds now that you don't feel like your meadow is serving the purpose that you want it to serve, then probably you do need to restart and um, take care of that stilt grass and other particularly troublesome weeds before you reseed it. Uh, I don't have any any experience with with Japanese stilt grass uh, directly, so I can't offer you any particular advice on that. Thank you. And um, this is a similar type of question: Is we planted a meadow six years ago? and the native goldenrod took over and has crowded out almost all the other plants. We know we need to start over and don't want to make the same mistakes. So are there some other plants that we should avoid? I guess in, uh, avoiding the uh, goldenrod and mm. anything else. Um, so the, the goldenrod that tends to take over is the um, Salvadego canadensis because it spreads from rhizomes. Uh, if you look at my um, list of species, you'll notice um, Ohio goldenrod, stiff goldenrod, um, and showy goldenrod. And those are three species that provide the same pollinator value, the same types of flowers and resources to bees, but uh, are not rhizomatous. They will tend to uh, increase over time uh, through seed, but they are much slower to do that than the other type of goldenrod. So I think it is important that we include goldenrod in the meadows because it is, it is that late, late fall uh, resource that is so important to uh, bees, but also include a good uh, dose of uh, New England aster because those coexist with goldenrod really well and will help keep them in check. The other, um, well, on that piece of advice would be if you really don't want it to revert back to mostly goldenrod, then probably you're going to need to to do the site preparation and either smother it or kill it with herbicides um, next summer and make sure that it's uh, out of there before you, you reseed with a less competitive mix. 
the other part of your question was um, if there are other competitive species to avoid. The only other one that I get reactions from people who say, milkweed, what are you planting milkweed out there? I'm trying to get rid of milkweed. And that tends to be reactions from people that have pastures or, or hay fields because it apparently is it's very bad for the quality of hay and um, some species of milkweeds, not our common milkweed, are also toxic to, to certain uh, livestock. So if you're a farmer and growing hay, then you probably don't want to include milkweed in your, your mix. But I can't think out of all the other species that have tried any that are so competitive that I, oh, some I haven't tried because I laugh when I see them available in the seed catalogs. One is evening primrose, Enothera species, which is a, a native uh, weed or wildflower. Very pretty, but also very aggressive and assertive. And so I intentionally have never included that in a mix, but it still is in my in my meadows. And that's one I may try to edit a little bit and try to uh, cut it back before it goes to seed every year. Great, thank you. Um, and this is along the same lines, but uh, what is your recommended strategy for dealing with invasives in the meadow? Yeah, the invasives are a continuous um, challenge. My strategy is just to be aware of them, start with a clean slate, get your density established, and then um, make a visual note whenever you see the first invasive coming up. Um, at which point you may want to just cut it back to the ground, especially in a very young meadow, as opposed to trying to pull it, in which case you're pulling these, you know, feet of roots of bittersweet vine or other things and disturbing a lot of soil, which just opens the opportunity up for more invasive seeds to germinate. And that's where you really have problems is where you have disturbed soil. And I've had this experience with uh, woodchuck disturbance. Woodchucks like meadows quite well as nesting habitat for their little families. And it's not that they eat and destroy all the plants, it's that they dig these big tunnels to uh, live in and that creates bare soil. And then the invasives are the first things that, that come up in those areas. So I do keep an eye on those. I will cut them back to the ground if, if I don't wanna disturb the soil further. Um, or in late fall when I'm doing my, my mowing, that's the time I would go and try to completely remove the roots from them. Okay, thank you. Um, how do you manage woody encroachment on an established meadow? That is exactly the reason for mowing uh, occasionally, be it every year or every other year during the dormant season is to keep the, the woodies from coming in. Okay, all right. Uh, do I need to worry about deer damage? And I was actually thinking about this in your presentation when you were mentioning about bulbs, because where I live, I can't plant bulbs because the deer just immediately dig them up and, and consume them so they never actually emerge as flowers. But I was wondering, for people who live in, in deer, deer areas, uh, yeah. should they be concerned about this and yeah. strategies? Um, actually, a lot of these species have proven themselves to be not real attractive to deer and the other thing is that when you have a mixture of things the deer seem to have to work harder to find the ones that they do like and so if there's something else equally attractive they're they're more apt to uh, go there i'm not certainly not saying that deer are never going to eat these and i think they're most susceptible probably in that first year when they're small green tender uh, seedlings uh, whereas once they're robust established plants that grow very, very quickly, there's going to be a lot less um, temptation for the deer to eat them. Okay, all right. And then finally, our last question, uh, it's a very specific one, is how do you manage aphids on milkweed? <laughs> I don't. Um, I look at this uh, meadow as, a, as an ecosystem that needs to find its own balance, <laughs> with the exception of those invasive plants. And I guess invasive insects as well, but uh, milkweed aphids are always going to occur on milkweed. Um, they're kind of neat if you if you can appreciate their their color and their ability to um, reproduce quickly. Um, but generally, they're fairly temporary in terms of how long they're around, and they you know will do some damage to the plant. But the plants seem to be robust enough to uh, tolerate that, and so it's 
kind of the same with, with monarch butterflies. You know, the caterpillars of monarch butterflies have to eat milkweed and they will decimate milkweed uh, during that life cycle. But everybody loves monarchs, so they're willing to uh, allow that to happen. So you just have to kind of broaden your, your acceptance of everything from deer to woodchucks to um, you know, these different insects and, for example, powdery mildew may come in on your bergamot and another reason you may not want it right in your front yard, but out further, it's not a devastating disease. It may be a little bit unsightly, but I've never uh, done anything in the meadows in terms of trying to manage any pests or diseases. I figure this is kind of a place where plants need to, to fight it out and find their niche and may the best survivors win. Okay, great. Wonderful. Well, thank you very, very much for taking the time to do this and uh, for us to answer the questions we didn't get time to. And uh, thank you. It just, it's been really helpful and I'm sure people will get a lot out of the recording. So thank you. Great. It's been fun. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.